This one is just going to be the journey that we went through to get to instinctive migratory grazing and then where we have actually used it as a tool in our operation incorporated into some more um, planned grazing type deals. I am going to let you know up front that this presentation I have not been able to get below an hour and a half. So if you have to get up and leave, you're not going to offend me if you have other places that you need to be. Um, and we may even go a little bit longer than an hour and a half. I, I will try my best to talk my way through it as fast as I can without like running away. So um, we'll go ahead and get started here. So I, I saw this quote a, a few days ago and I really liked it. And a teacher is never a giver of truth. He's a guide, a pointer to the truth that each student must find for himself. And that really embodies how this journey of ours went. We didn't ever have anybody tell us specifically, you need to do this. I went, I listened, my husband went and listened to various speakers, we've read different books, we've studied different techniques, and from all that, we pulled what we needed to fit our operation. And so I hope also what you guys pull from me is what will fit your operation. It may not completely mimic what I have up here, but there may be parts of it that will be the missing key or the missing link that you are needing. So who are we? Um, my <coughs> husband and myself and our 11-year-old daughter, we ranch in eastern Wyoming in Lance Creek. Probably most of you don't know where Lance Creek is at. We are northwest of Lusk, about 35 miles. You can see some of the terrain there in the backgrounds. Some of it's pretty flat, and then some of it's kind of rolling sagebrush hills. And then you'll see some other pictures where we've got some cedar breaks and some draws that are on our place as well. But we're just ranchers. Everything that we have done scientifically, we have just tried to use the best scientific method that we could within our operation. So where do we ranch? There's some more pictures of some of the stuff that we ranch in. And we do get snow occasionally. We are an 8,000 acre wheatgrass and sagebrush plains in eastern Wyoming. The regional stocking rate for our area is 35 to 40 acres to the cow. That right there is going to be a key figure throughout this presentation. Traditionally, on 8,000 acres, we're a 200 cow outfit. And that is with supplemental winter feeding of some sort. Historically, we bought this ranch from my husband's family. Historically, when his family ran it, he had 4,000 acres of summer range, 4,000 acres of winter range. The county road was the division. So every year, the west side was winter range, the east side was summer range. That's how it was for 40 years prior to us taking this over. What do our cattle look like? Well, we run primarily black cows. There are some Red Angus cows, Red Angus Cross, and we do have some Hereford cows out there. We have ran Hereford bulls before. We are moderate frame, deep girth, and easy fleshy. 900 to 1100 pound mature cows. Our cows are not big. They have to be able to range and they have to be able to survive on what our environment produces. Our mature bulls will be 12 to 1400 pounds. They are small for most people's standards. Where do you find those bulls? I find those particular bulls right now out of Rose, Nebraska. And it's going back to very old school genetics. Is that the, what kind of a brain storm they have? Off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you. Those are uh, Shoshone Angus genetics. Um, no, actually, they're going back to Y. Y, okay. Yep, a lot of Y influence in those particular bulls that we're using right now. Now, I have, now on our journey, I have used Redland bulls from over here. I've used Paint Rock bulls from over here. As we started to figure out that we needed to change some things, I've drifted away from them, but I would not be afraid to go back to them. Those, those are the type of cattle that we are using, though, to put it in a reference for your guys' area. We're predominantly black Angus, as you can see, but we have some Hereford influence. And up until this year, we marketed a 480 pound steer calf in January. Weaned in November, marketed in January. This year, as I alluded to in the other presentation, we actually are, are swapping over to the <coughs> cow calf yearling operation. So we didn't have any weights on our calves this year, but we know historically that's where we want to be. Were those calves born in June? June calves. Yep. So a key timeline. 
And, we'll, and I'll just kind of run this as a timeline of, of how we have evolved into what we are today. We started in 2007 when we bought the family ranch. We completed pipeline projects. Up until that time, there were windmills and stock ponds, reservoirs, that watered the place. Justin and I were looking at this one pasture that we graze right now, that we're in right now, and I was like, what was the water before we pipelined this? Because right now we have two pipeline tanks in that. He says, there was a two gallon a minute windmill, and the reservoir at the other end that you can see. And it was, I don't know, a 900, well at that time it was about a 1500 acre pasture. And that was the water source, one on each end, one of them was very marginal. So um, when we bought it, we went ahead and pipelined, we have about 21 miles of pipeline throughout the entire place. Two 400 barrel um, storage tanks that hook to the pipeline, and two wells that feed that pipeline, and we can get to every tank but one with either well. So we've got backups in place so that when one goes down, we still get water to everything. We developed a cattle management philosophy. It already had kind of stemmed on what Justin was doing. He um, was already a May calver. He, by, so before we bought the ranch, he was happening to lease out. There wasn't room for him on the ranch, and so he was leasing grass out wherever he could find it. And he wasn't able to always get to his cows every day. Some of the places he found for lease, it was 20 miles of two track to get into them. And so he was happening to already develop a very low cost herd just by circumstance. Our cattle grazed year round, but we did do two pounds of 30% range cake supplemented daily from December to May. And like I said, we were May calvers. And we did put up our own hay if we needed it. He has some sub irrigated ground on the inside of um, the ranch. And so occasionally we would put up a little bit of hay there if we needed it. Didn't feed it though. We have not fed hay really to speak of to our cows in almost 25 years now. There has been two storms that I can think of an instance that we panicked and rolled some hay out. Didn't really need to, but at what point does you just gotta say enough is enough and it's not gonna hurt us to put six bales out. In 2008, we had a desire to expand our land base. We started looking around. There was no place to lease. There was no place to buy that was close to us. We didn't want to expand several miles away. We wanted to stay as close as we could. So then we got to thinking, how can we do this? Well, we didn't think at that time that we, could, we were getting the production that we could be getting out of our ground. So that's when we studied, began studying various grazing and ranching management methods. I mean, we've just anything we could get our hands on, we were absorbing out of it. Anything and everything that we could to try to piece into our place and make it work. Some of the influential authors and practitioners that we read along the way, Chip Hines, Jim Garish, Alan Nation, Burke Teichert, Alan Savory, Johann Yacht Zeisman, Dick Divin, Walt Davis, those were some of the early influences in what we did and how we got started. It was just a kind of a look at our library, I don't think that's a complete library. <coughs> so then, as I read through all that stuff, there were some management keys that kept repeatedly coming up. And to begin with, fit the cattle to the natural environment. We knew our environment couldn't support an 1,800 pound cow. We weren't even trying to, to strive for that. We day work a lot, I hadn't mentioned that earlier, but um, one of the ranches we day work on, he's been there forever. We know that his environment, even with supplementation, raises a 525 pound April born calf. Once he takes those cattle out of that environment, he can get 600 to 650 pound calves if he takes them to the right environment. So which tells us the cattle can fit different environments, but that particular environment that he was in, 525 pound calf is what can be raised. You can't expect more than that out of what you have. So we had to figure out what our environment could support. High intensity, short duration. You hear it all the time. Put a whole bunch of pounds in here for a short amount of time. Okay, we're rangeland, we're not irrigated. Management intensive grazing with a plan. Okay, so now we gotta do all this with a plan. Multi paddock systems. Everything I was reading said you gotta have at least 20 paddocks, at least 20 pastures in your system to make this thing work. Take half, leave half. These are all things that I'm sure all of you have heard. And the soil needs plant litter from trampling. So that half that you leave has gotta be trampled in too. 
So we go back to the timeline. Now we started keeping records of our cattle and our grazing. So I had a red book, calving book. Some people call them calving books, red books. Started writing down pasture times in, pasture times out, number of cattle, just real simple things. What that led to, sorry University of Wyoming, but University of Nebraska-Lincoln has a free grazing record available online. So I grabbed it up. It's a workbook, an Excel workbook, already built out. All I had to do was plug my numbers into it. And from there, I can pull all kinds of utilization records um, as far as forage. What I do, they talked about that in this previous um, presentation about measuring your forage by utilization. That's exactly what everything of mine is built on, is how, if my cows used it, I had to have grown it. Simple as that. So then I could calculate basically how much they use. When I started stringing all this together, then you could see trends over the years start to develop. Because I was doing the same thing, I wasn't bouncing around. Same calculation every year, and I knew how much forage I was producing. Then I started doing annual photo point transects. So I had this nifty little form, our work document, and I take a picture every, well, now I do every year because now I really see the value in this. I was, you'll see in some of my data that I'm missing some pieces. But I take a picture every year at every point in every pasture that I have established. Just so I can visually see what is my ground doing over time. I think it's improving, but if I compare these two, boy, no, we've really gone backwards or, yeah, our ground is really improving. I do it at the same time, roughly every year, late on, same time, late August to October. It's kind of a, a, a wide range, but I try to do it in the fall, late summer. And then I do a cover by life transect. And all that is is a spreadsheet in which I tally up the type of plants that I see. So basically, I run that 100 foot transect, and at every foot, I look down, if I were a raindrop, what am I going to hit first? Am I going to hit a perennial plant? Am I going to hit an annual plant? Am I going to hit a forb? Am I going to hit um, litter, bare soil, rock? And then I just total it all up. I do this at all my sites. So now I'm starting to collect some data and build some data, some compilation things that show some trends happening over time. So this is, this is all I do for record keeping. I don't care what my cows are doing. I don't care that 789 raised an 800 pound calf. I care about what my ground is doing and what my plants are doing. So back to the timeline, still in 2008, we discovered we had some personal roadblocks to changing our grazing methods. We started keeping the data, we started listening to what people were saying, and those roadblocks for us were well, we're in a semi-arid, brittle, short grass environment. Tall grass in our environment is a foot. Right? So there's not a lot of grazing there. A lot of it, we have a lot of buffalo grass. I don't know if you're familiar with buffalo grass and blue grandma, but in our country, tall is like this. Short growing season. Okay? Everything that I was reading was talking, you know, it's in the south or it's in the east, and they have a lot of rainfall and moisture, and their growing season runs from like April to October. Now ours does too, but we don't get a lot of growth in April, and we don't get a lot of growth in October. Our growth is primarily, especially for our area, May, June. June 15th, we're done. Limited precipitation during the growing season. We're kind of in a 12 to 15 inch precipitation area. Some of you are going to be more than that, some of you are going to be less than that, even across the state of Wyoming. Limited finances for additional fencing and water development. Like, the money's not there. You just you can't jump out and build all this infrastructure and get everything to work. The logistics of moving temporary fence that encompass 50-plus acre paddocks. Everything I'm reading, these guys are grazing these tiny little paddocks for a day. And then they move and they graze another tiny little paddock for a day. And I'm like, um, those paddock sizes right there, I couldn't even put my entire herd in and feed them for a day. There's, we don't have that kind of production. So how can we do this differently? Well, you, you make your paddocks bigger. Well, I really don't want to move 50 acres worth of electric fence. Or go out and chop up my pastures, 1,000 acres, into 50 acre little paddocks. It just seemed ridiculous to me. And the other one was, where do we find the time to make daily moves of cattle and fence? I'd mentioned we day work. 
it's, it's a vacation for us. We like because places we day work on, their pastures are as big as our place. So it's like we get to go ride the big country, and then we come back and take care of our our operations. So we weren't really interested in not day working anymore, not going seeing the big country and stuff. So we're like, we're not willing to give that up. And if we were willing to give that up, then that meant we had to do fencing. And then how do we fence some of the rough terrain in some of those pastures? You saw some of the cedar draws. We've got some ridges that are cedar covered. And we're looking at that going, we don't even like to like permanent fence that. You can't drive a post in any of it. This is not going to be a lot of fun to put temporary fence into and zigzag around this, this uh, cedar tree and try to drop off this bank and make it all work. Then how do we utilize our poor producing ground without abusing the high producing ground? We're rangeland. We are so varied. We have badlands and pastures that are right next, well actually are now incorporated into sub-irrigated meadows. Well, you either fence things in or fence things out or figure out how to graze it different. And then how do we intensely graze our place, but still ensure that we have enough forage <coughs> to winter graze? So a lot of these intensive grazing systems were set up to just graze the plants that were growing. They were annual plants, and they're going to wipe them out for that year. We couldn't do that. We needed to use our annual and perennial plants to not only graze the growing season long, but also get us all the way through the winter. So we couldn't take everything off at the take half, leave half, or even take 90% like I've heard some operations doing in their intensive grazing stuff. So we had to figure out what is a different way around this. So the timeline, 2008, we started down our own adapted grazing path. We looked at our roadblocks, we looked at ways that we could possibly work with them, and we began. So here's our adapted grazing path in 2008. We split our two largest pastures with permanent fence. Gave us 21 total pastures of varying sizes, all with a good water supply with the pipeline that we had already put in. So now, they, all the gurus said, you need 20 pastures. We got them. We got 20 pastures, all with good water. Biggest rule, never use a pasture at the same time of the year for consecutive years. So in January, if we graze this pasture, we don't get to be in it in January next year. If June we graze that pasture, guess what? That pasture's out of the rotation in June. It falls somewhere else in the whole scheme of things. Rest at least one of our larger pastures for the growing season, for the entire growing season. So we had 21 pastures. We kicked one out, one of our biggest pastures out every year. So now we had 20 pastures to rotate through. But by leaving the largest pasture we had, we felt like we could probably winter the most of the winter on what forage was grown in there and that allowed us to go ahead and start on our path. Then we had to move the cattle when they had roughly ate half, trampled half. Have any of you guys ever tried to look at that and go, if they ate half, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> well, over here they've eaten half, but they haven't touched this over here, so are we at 75% you see? You know, where are we adding this? That to me is like one of the hardest things to do. It's like, I don't know what half is. You just heard him say in the last presentation if you were in here, half of the plant is the, bo like the bottom half of the plant is actually 75% of your plant mass. Well, so now you're looking at taking your plants way down. Well, do they, do they bite thin 60% of that plant? It's all a guessing game. Monitor the composition of everything covering our ground, and that's where you saw the record keeping. We started looking at everything that was on the ground. And then we challenged our cows when necessary. And then every time, if we, if we were able to get our hands on something new, we were reading it, we were going and listening to the speakers, we were trying to pull anything and everything from people that would fit what we need. So, now we go into the middle years. We've gone through 2008, we've done this up until 2011, and in 2011, we were actually able to lease out extra stockpiled winter grass. So we were still running our 200 pairs, and we had extra grass that we were able to lease out. Stocking rate, though, with lease cows coming in, put us at 28 acres to the cow. Remember, we started at 35 to 40 acres to the cow. So now we've already now been able to stock more cattle to our acres. In 2012, it was the most severe drought seen in years. Drop bottoms never greened up. 
we did, I was looking back through precipitation records. We didn't get really measurable precipitation until August. So nothing in our growing season, but we brought cattle in to help out another drought-stricken operator. Little operator, 50 head, we're like, we'll find room for them, bring them, see what we can do. Our cattle grazed year-round. We didn't feed hay during the drought. Two pounds of 30% range cake supplemented daily, December to May. We made it through 2012. We had some opens, we destocked, we kicked them out, but we still grazed. 2013, we looked at things because we had some winter storms hit in May, blizzards, Mother's Day blizzards, three years in a row. And we looked at that and said, hmm, we don't calve in February and March and April because we don't like blizzards. May's no different. So we moved to June calving. That reduced our winter feeding of cows to a half pound of 30% range cake December to May. And we quit putting up our own hand. We're like, this is, this is ridiculous. This is, not, this is a money-losing proposition right here to be putting up our own hay. Our stocking rate in 2013, or by 2013, so in two years' time, we're now at 20 acres to the cow. In 2015, we made another shift. We said, well, girls, sorry. Half a pound is ridiculous to be kicking out here to you. You are going to get no winter feed supplementation. Salt, sage, and scenery is what you girls get. <laughs> in 2016, no insecticides used on the cattle. We said, ridiculous to pour them. Get rid of those. Let's see, let's see what you girls can do. In 2016, we saw our stocking rate go to 17 acres to the cow. In 2015, when you went to no winter feed supplementation, did you have to pull a little harder after that year? No. Nope. No? The cows adjusted pretty easily? Yep. We had some fallout, you know, and we, our young cows, they, they get hit kind of hard. We have methods that we now market differently to try to accompany for that or account for that. So by 2016, we have reached our second ranch by changing our grazing management. So now bring on 2017. Where do we go from here? We've got our second ranch. Are we satisfied? No. <coughs> we went to a deal just like this. And we listened to Gabe Brown speak. And uh, we also repeated our stocking rate of 17 acres to the cow, which told us that we're on a, a decent path. If we're able to repeat this, it wasn't a one-year fluke. But we still weren't satisfied with the results. Some of the insight I got from Gabe Brown, first thing, principles of grazing are the same regardless of the environment. Gabe Brown is a huge cover crop grazer. That does not fit range ground at all. When I asked him, I'm like, we got range ground. What would you plant for a cover crop? He's, his eyes got big. He's like, nothing. Do not touch your native range ground. Leave it be. It's as diverse of a, of a mix as you can possibly find in nature. So don't do anything but pay attention to the principles. The principles of grazing are the same, regardless of the environment. Application of the principles, however, may look a little bit different for each environment, each operation. So he brings up the, the five principles of, of soil health. I went ahead and interpre interpreted them into my world. First thing, limit the disturbances. Herbicides and pesticides. Don't be spraying your weeds. Don't be pouring your cows. Those are herbicides and pesticides. You already saw in 16 that we were able to get rid of pouring our cows. You, you wouldn't tell. So some of those pictures in the early on the deal of our cows were taken in January. They weren't lousy. They weren't rubbing. You, to go out, you might find a missing spot of hair on our cows, maybe one. It's amazing when, when you quit pouring them what their natural resiliency will do. Armor the soil surface. You need litter and growing vegetation to cover your ground. When we started measuring what was covering our ground, we didn't have a lot of cover. We had a lot of bare ground. And then we'd have some litter, and then we got to paying attention to what was on our ground and what the litter was doing. We'd get a big rainstorm, and it would just run sheets of water, you know. But as we're riding, we're kind of looking down, looking around here. And we started to notice that this litter where you'd have the sheets come down, it was gathering up this litter, and then eventually it'd build a dam. And it would pool that water just a little bit. It would slow it down. So now we weren't losing all of our water 
to reservoirs and draws. Some of it was being retained on the soil surface because of the plant life and the litter that was blocking this and slowing it down. So we had a chance to get some infiltration. And then, of course, growing vegetation. The longer you can keep vegetation growing in the ground, live roots in the ground, the healthier everything's going to be in and around your soil and runoff, even winter runoff. We, had, we just had a thaw here on Saturday in Lance Creek, and we had some runoff, but our ground is so saturated, and we haven't had a hard freeze. Um, we, well, we maybe froze finally now after this last week, but we, had, we were digging post holes in two weeks ago and not digging any frost. But it was wet. We were wet two foot, three foot down. We've got growing roots in the ground. Build diversity, plant types, and the season of growth. We're fortunate. We have cool season and warm season grasses. We have forbs. We have perennial grasses. We have annual grasses. Um, we have brush. We have all kinds of different diversity, and all of them serve a different function in our pastures. Season of growth, cheatgrass. People want to get rid of cheatgrass? We love it because about middle of March, our cheatgrass starts coming. That's what our cows are grazing. And then other species start growing, and they graze that, and other species, and so on. And then you get into late, late summer, early fall, your cheatgrass is, a, is cool season grass again. Boy, it jumps again, and you have another little boost to your cattle. And then, I already kind of touched on that up there, but keep the living roots in the soil. And on January 20th, I was out putting out salt, and I went to this, I was just driving along, and I'm like, a lot of grass here. It's a pretty thick mat of grass here. So I got out and I started kind of digging around. There was an incredible amount of green grass underneath that, that thick mat. And right next to it was a spot where a cattle had grazed. And you could see they had targeted that green grass as well as the dry, dormant grass that they were feeding on. So we've got living roots in the soil now, at least in, through January. And integrate animals. Animal impact is huge. It's your free fertilizer. They also, with their hoof impact, help break up soils. Different, there's all, I mean, you can read all kinds of different things. That's a whole other talk on what animal impact can do to your ground. So back to the timeline in the middle years, 2017. We also stumbled upon instinctive migratory grazing. So it was founded by Bob Kinford. He's a gentleman out of Texas. He started studying animals 60 years ago when he was a kid. And he started looking at the difference between sheep and cattle and how they graze. And traditional sheep operations, old sheep operations, you'd see the herder out with the sheep and the sheep would be in this nice little herd and they'd be up on a side hill grazing or up on a flat grazing. And you look at cattle and they're everywhere. They are spread out over the pasture. And he's like, why, why the difference? And so then he started studying how people were handling it. And that's how he actually then started to develop the ideas behind stockmanship and the way it affects grazing. And so he kept studying, kept studying. And he went down to Mexico and worked with some ranches down there. And he finally led to the idea that it actually the change in your stockmanship reboots the natural migratory instinct of cattle and how you approach them. And it relaxes them, and now they want to go ahead and graze, like we think of the big herds of buffalo did at one time. They, gra they migrated from place to place, picking out whatever they needed at the time to fit their diet. And that's what the instinctive migratory grazing basically does. Horsemanship and stockmanship are the keys to reducing stress on the herd. Creates a low stress atmosphere surrounding the cattle and increases the feed efficiency and animal performance. We've, we've not got a direct measure on feed efficiency. We've got an eyeball measure on animal performance. Our cows have looked the best right now in January as they ever have. We attribute that highly to how they were able to graze and store back fat all through the grazing season and fall and continuing to graze through the winter. Cattle naturally want to stay together as much to the extent that the forage and water availability will allow. Now if you've got a highly productive field, cattle are going to want to tend to, they will get shoulder to shoulder and push through and graze. Ours, we're not that productive. So our cattle are spread out. But you could see, if this, if this room was our pasture, you could see all of our cows in the general direction of this corner. And none of them over here. And going pointed in the same general direction as they're moving and as they're grazing. 
and then they will come into water at the same time. Does that mean they all get to drink at exactly the same time? No, they systematically come in based on the pecking order of the herd, and they get their drink, and then they go back out somewhere else and ruminate. A lot of our tank areas are not beat out. They'll be beat out one, two, maybe three cow wits back from the tank, but the rest you'll have standing forage laying around it, standing, I mean, standing around it and stuff. It hasn't been grazed, it hasn't been trampled. Work on cow time, not our time, that was a huge shift. We had to move, be ready to move cows when cows were ready to move, not when we are. We were disrupting and adding stress when we were like, we've got to, we got to be to town by four, we got to have these cows gathered and into the next pasture that's three miles away, so we need to get this done now. We know it's going to take all day. When we, when we switched our, our whole view on that, like, all right, so we got to have those cows there. We're going to change the way our stockmanship runs. We're actually getting there a lot faster. We're working them different. We're working them slower. But we're getting where we need to go faster just through the stockmanship changes that we made in IMG. <laughs> Some of the observed changes in the cattle, the forage, and the land. Um, we said cattle leave the water areas to ruminate. But what do they leave behind? All the fertilizer, and then the trample in their um, rumination areas. They lay down, they ruminate, they rest. When they get up, what does every cow do? She stretches, and she goes to the bathroom. And then they move on. So when you've got a whole herd localized in an area like this, you have now just effectively spread as much fertilizer as you could, as close as you possibly could. And it could be a, a thousand acre pasture, but they're embedded down, ruminating, in an area this size. Cattle migrate as a herd around the pasture seeking forages um, that best fit their nutritional need. We watched our cows this year, it was interesting, we grazed, grazed clover four different times. And so we'd kick into a pasture and they'd top the plants. Top third, all the clover plants, gone. And it would just happen to be that it worked into our rotation that we were moving to the next pasture. Same thing, clover, gone. So we're like, that's interesting. So at one point, we opened the gates about four miles from our branding corral, and there was one, two, three, four, five pastures between where our cows were at and the branding corral. We just opened all the gates. This is about our second, no, third graze, fourth graze on some of the clover, third and fourth graze on a lot of the clover. And they would, they would literally, they grazed all the clover out of this pasture, found the gate, came in and grazed all the clover out of this pasture, found the gate, kept going. We'd go out, because we had a plan in place. I'm like, oh, we need to go make sure the cows have moved. And they had. They'd moved themselves on. They had never grazed the, it down further than a third, top third of the plant. They left a very nice residual height. But they were just, that's what they wanted. They wanted the clover. Now they would balance it with grass. And so whenever they needed grass or whatever else, they'd grab it. But they were primarily hunting the clover. Cattle seldom take more than a top third of the plant unless we force them. If we forced them to stay in a pasture longer, they would take more than that top third. If we let them migrate around and get what they need and kick them onto the next pasture, they're going to take the top third of the next pasture, so on and so on. Even in the winter, they're still only grazing the top of the plants until we get down later this winter when there's not a lot of the plant left, they're going to have to take lower. Like the grazed areas looked like they'd been mechanically mowed to the same residual plant height. It was the most cra it was the craziest thing we'd seen ever. Like who would have ever dreamed that cattle would come in and make an area look like it had been mowed off? We saw an increase in perennial plants and a or an increase in plant density and diversity for our record keeping. We also saw an increase in plant health and an increase in the soil health. We haven't got a you know, we haven't got a true measure of that, but we can see it in our plants. And so that's what we assume we're seeing when we see dark, vibrant green plants right next to washed out, pale, sick looking plants. When we, when we see the difference there, you, we assume that the soil health is a lot healthier under these vibrant green plants that are exactly the same plant that's over here. Green grass remaining further into the traditional dormant season. So, a couple of videos here. This is literally, they're grazing the top third of the plants. This cow's got some clover, 
Um, not sure what else might be in that mix. This cow, eating sagebrush. This is June and this cow is eating sagebrush. Everybody tells me cows won't eat sagebrush. There's tannins in sagebrush and cows don't like it. So I started doing a little bit of research on tannins. Yeah, do you want to look into that? It's an antiparasitic. It won't let parasites attach to the intestinal wall. Um, they're looking at it for anti, what, antiviral. So it's actually possibly tannins are a possible alternative to um, antibiotic use, things like that. Sagebrush contains tannins. We've known our cows will eat this stuff. Everybody will tell us they won't, but they do, and they do well on it. So this is just the best way that I can show some residual plant height in July. That's a one liter Aqua Vista bottle. These cattle, one day I went out to put salt out, I found the whole herd in this little basin. Um, basically, I don't think I have a picture. Basically from the bottom of this picture to the pickup is where their whole herd was laying. I wish I'd had my camera at that time because it was exactly what I needed to capture. But I didn't. So then I came out a couple days later and I was like, well, I want to see what they did for impact and grazing and see if I can record that somehow. At the time I went out to this, these cows, this was on their march back towards the grazing, or towards the branding trails. They were three miles from this location. They could care less about this location. You can see everything's kind of level with the top of that water bottle. That's what they left. Side effects to IMG that we started to see, our winter grazing had changed. Um, when they graze as a herd, you always think about it that the strong would break trail, the weaker on the back end. We saw that. We saw the mid-range cows breaking through, digging through the crust of the snow, breaking up everything. Your middle-edged cows, they're kind of coming behind. But they're breaking a little bit different paths, but they're not breaking the true trail. And then behind that was our older cows. Everything that had already been churned up, it hadn't all been grazed because they're taking a bite here and taking a bite there as they go. So they were still leaving plants, so when the next cow comes, there's still plants for her to graze. Our weaker cows had trail broke for them. They weren't happening to work as hard to winter graze. Major shifts in the way the cattle handled, I kind of touched on that this morning. Runbacks, we very seldom have runbacks. If we do, the calf, we might have a calf that takes off. Might take off and go a half mile away. And then pretty soon you'll look up and hear this calf will loop around and come right back into the herd. Never had to go get them. We get into a new pasture. We don't have calves crowding the fence. They go right to mom, they go right to nursing, or they drop their head and they graze because we changed our stockmanship and our approach to them. I've talked about the kind of the, the tidal wave coming back out of the corral. We've been to some brandings and everybody's like, oh, these, these cattle are terrible. We got, we got a rip and spur, you know, you got a branding crew, 20, 25 riders, and got them surrounded, and they're hooping and hollering and whipping and spurring. And my husband and I go to the lead, and we start working, and pretty soon them cattle filter into the corral, and we pull them away from everybody on the back end, and they go in the corral, and they stand, and everybody's like, what? I thought these cattle were bad. Like, Change your stockmanship, guys. You just change the whole mindset of those cows. Now, those ranches, are they changing? No. They'll have a problem every time. But we can, the stockmanship change, it's incredible the side effects and the ripple effect that it has when you start using it even on cattle that aren't your own. Systemic change to the behavior. Once you consistently use it on a set of cows, it's second nature to them, and it's, they don't know any different. Cattle balance their own diet. We've already kind of touched on that. Shift in the grass quality and quantity. Uh, this one, we graze green grass mid-March through mid-December. Well, I guess I get to update this slide because now I get to say we graze green grass up through mid-January at least. And when I get back, I'll look around in a new pasture that we haven't kicked into yet. We may have green grass that we're kicking into middle of February. 
And if that's the case, we're now to year-round green grass available. Stocking rate, after using IMG, we still stay at 17 acres to the cow. So we knew we hadn't made a mistake. What we did in our trials, we still were able to maintain 17 acres to the cow off of a 35 to 40 acre to the cow ranch. So we're still running double our stocking rate for three consecutive years. We ran double the stocking rate. So some of you asked about some of the techniques. This is some June calving, June 24th and June calving cows and pears. Moving them by myself. I think I do have one dog with me. I'm starting them from the front. You see there it is walking by me. They've got calves gathered up. Most of them are traveling as pairs. The calf might be right at their might not be right at their side, but it's not a long ways away. It might be 20 or 30 feet back. We happen to be doing, because this was in the middle of calving, we tried to hit some smaller pastures and make shorter pasture changes. We do have one part of our rotation that is a three mile hike. We divided it up. So this is the starting technique. You can see my horse. She's actually flexed in her head the way I want those cows to go. She has lateral movement that you don't necessarily see, but watch the cow's reaction to her. They're actually coming at her. They're walking towards her. I'm not driving these cows anywhere. And all she's doing is translating the cues that I've given her and how to approach them. She's translated that to the cattle. This is a young horse that I'm working with, so it's not as fluid and smooth as I'd like also, but you got to train them sometime. So actually I started them towards a gate, and the gate is right there. So I've got motion in this herd. If, if I, you're starting near the gate, moving toward the cattle, and then, and then, and then moving off to the side, and going about two thirds of the way to the end of the herd, and then turn around and coming back. Mm -hmm. I, I could go clear to the end of the herd if I wanted to. I wanted this video to be shorter. But you never want to go to the back. Now, I, you can go to the back, but you can't stay back there. And so, you know, you're going you're to see me on the back of my cows, but you're going to see me pass behind them so that I can come up to this side and work my way back down. So the cows are always escaping around you, if you will. Yep. The, the really cool thing about this, too, is sometimes I don't go all the way to the back of my herd. Where you saw me turn around, I might have slid through, and it won't disrupt that pulling motion. I slide through, go back up to the front. These that were behind me, are still coming right along. And that's with my dog. I can slide through those pairs with my dog. And they are still just like, whoop, we're moving as a herd. Here we go. So here's where I sat until all the cows had come through that gate. I didn't want to sit you, sit you there for 10 minutes. <laughs> but that's all it took for me to change those pastures. That's all it takes. Anytime we go out and move our cows now, we change our stockmanship and our approach, and now we have a whole different look to things. We have a whole different look to the entire ranch, our stress levels, the cow stress levels. So we had some roadblocks removed. We had no additional infrastructure investment. No daily moves of cattle or fences. Now some of our pastures, we had three day moves. There is, I'll take that back. There is one pasture, it's 70 acres. And 70 acres is what it took for all those cows to have one day of feed. That's how we figured that out. Well, they're out of grass. <laughs> Gotta move them today, don't get two days out of this. So, you know, we did have one pasture with one day move. I can deal with that. No overgrazing of brittle or fragile plants. We didn't get second grazes on plants because we're kind of flash grazing, they're only taking the top third. Guess what, when you take the top third of a plant, that plant doesn't require nearly as much energy to regrow. You're just taking the top leaf mass, and then you're getting out of there. No back or second grazing until plant recovery, because they're like, we've already, we've already touched those plants, we've already ate them, there's nothing there that we want. We want these plants over here that we haven't grazed yet. 
And then we want those and those. And so they're working their way around the pasture. But we did have some continued roadblocks. How do we keep from being understocked and overgrazed? Kind of, kind of an oxymoron sounding like, how, how are you understocked and overgrazed? Well, when your cattle aren't, you don't have enough cattle to affect enough plants in the timing of everything. You have to up your stocking rate so that you get that kind of animal impact when you need it and then get them off there. So if you're understocked, there's no way we could cover our entire ranch, 8,000 acres with 200 pair. This ranch rated for 200 pair, right? We couldn't effectively graze it with 200 pair. So we were understocked. Our ranch was understocked. There were places that were still overgrazed. How do we increase the intensity without running short on our winter grass? Like, okay, we get the understock thing. Let's bring in 2,000 head of yearlings and run in here. Well, great. You just did that. And you just created all this animal impact, and you got a good grazing on everything. But now what are you going to do for winter feed? So we still had some more things to learn. So in 2019, then, another breakthrough. Went and listened to Ian Mitchell in his talk, South African grazer. He is doing phenomenal things on his ranch. So yes, it's South Africa, but I've already said the principles are the same. How you apply them is different for the environments. He has taken and cut his third ranch into thirds. He grazes a third, he leases out a third, and there's a third that he does not have time to deal with at all. He has gone from his traditional stocking rate for his entire ranch to running six times that rate on the third that he's grazing. And you go, how? How do you do that? Is it your environment that allows you to do that? So I listened to him, and when the light came on, he created a flexible style grazing plan, and I looked at that and I said, that flexible style grazing plan will use my IMG tool beautifully. They dovetailed together. We shifted the, our focus to plant recovery time. No longer now did I care if I'd taken half or left half or taken the top third or whatever. I was shifted my focus to plant recovery time. We're growing really fast. We got rain in May and June and our plants are just shooting up. And in about two weeks, that clover that we were chasing was fully regrown. So every two weeks, we could come back into the same pasture and graze those same plants and had not ever damaged them. So now we've got this much usage. Two weeks later, we got this much usage off the same plant. Two weeks later, we got this much usage off the same plant. That's how you increase the amount. It's not you didn't increase your plants. You increased the way you were using it and the utilization you were getting off of these plants and their growth and regrowth. So we had multiple grazings of the plants throughout the growing season, one small bite at a time. Tops of the plants. He also gave in his presentation the formula that, would, that we based our grazing plan. And then we followed that formula up with observation of our plants and then data analysis too. Is what we're seeing with our eye matching what our plan said should be happening? And then is the year end data backing that up as well. IMG, its role in this allowed us to, to graze large and small pastures in the same fashion. So I told you one pasture of our 70 acres would hold, we had 250 pair and 100 yearlings, you know, 100 yearling replacement heifers running in there, that would hold them for a day. So 70 acres is what I needed for that entire bunch in a day. If I go graze a 700 acre pasture, I have 10 days worth of grazing in there because they're not grazing the same location. But I didn't have to fence those 10 locations. My cows are finding those locations. They're doing this on their own. We get into bigger pastures, same thing. Can I ask a question? You can. Is that because they want to stay together? It is. The reason they put them out? It is. We've reduced the stress, and they want to stay together, and they want to go do what nature has intended for them to do, and that is to balance their own diet and be cows. But how long do you think you can train the cows? Five days. Hmm? Five days of consistent 
training. Not reverting back to old habits, because as soon as you revert back to an old habit, you undo what you've done. But yes, five days. So when you're grazing multiple times throughout the growing season, uh, when you stop grazing through the growing season, how much residual do you like to have? How much have you seen like, on that plant? Kind of dependent on the plant. When we quit grazing clover in August, they finally took the clover down. I'm okay with that. It was August and that plant was done. So it really is plant specific. I'm not concerned about residual height. I'm more concerned about getting them through and letting them top the plants. If we can get some slow growth, great. Our winter pastures, we're, we're grazing, the winter pastures are only about like that. And they've been, been grazed in the growing season, your winter pasture. Four to five times. <laughs> Yep. So this, this came from Ian. It's a rotational grazing formula that I use. So the information needed up front. Total days of rest for plant recovery. It goes right here. So on this one I wanted 15 days of total rest for each plant. So I, once that plant got bit, I couldn't come back to that pasture for 15 days. Individual pasture acreage. So this column right here is all my pasture acreages. You see it totals up to be 3,778. Total acreage to be grazed in this rotation, that was the 3,778. The ranking of the pasture in regards to quality. I've already said we're range ground. We are not even in quality. So what you want to take a look at is if you have a lesser quality pasture, you rank it less than one. They give it a percentage. If this pasture over here is only going to produce 70% of the forage that the rest of my pastures produce, then it has a ranking of 0.7. Likewise, if I've got, like we do, some sub-irrigated ground, it might double the production or triple the production. Well, it gets to be put in at higher than one, so maybe it's a two or a three. Okay, so what I do is, is, here's the formula up here. I just substitute in all the key pieces. What it spits out to me is the planned stay. All of this planned stay right here adds up to 15. What did I want 15 to be? I wanted 15 to be my total days of rest. So I knew ahead of time I wanted 15 days of rest. Basically what this does is it says, if this west house pasture, the top one, has a ranking of one, so it's a pretty average pasture. Then I'm going to take whatever acreage that is, 139, what percent is it of my total acres? And whatever that percentage is, I multiply it by 15. So if it's 10% of my total acres, then I'm only going to spend 10% of my 15 days grazing time in that pasture. So I'm only going to be in there a day and a half. You get to round that plan stay then to the nearest whole day. Or if you want to do half day moves, you do half day moves, I round it to the nearest whole day. So this is what we based our grazing plan on and used our IMG to move through it. A couple examples of our planned rotations. So this was May 23rd. Mind you, it was May 21st and 2nd that I listened to Ian. So May 23rd, we implemented this. 15-day rest period, May 23rd to June 19th. And we didn't plan to use the two smallest pastures. So if we look right here, plan stay. I didn't plan to use my house pasture, and I didn't plan to use this 28-road pasture because they just didn't, according to the plan, feel like they could support the amount of animals that we were putting in there. So they got kicked out. What we were actually able to do, though, and you see, we actually did use the house pasture because when we looked at it, when the time came for us to kick into that pasture, we looked at it, we said, no, those plants have recovered. We can go into this pasture. So it actually gained us a day. Well, what else happened? We also kind of did some observation along the way. We're like, wow, big hill pasture, two days ain't near long enough to stay in here. We can stay four. And then we looked and we said, hmm, plants aren't growing as fast as we thought they should be in some of these other pastures. So I need to stay a little longer in the Ripley so that I can get one day 
out of the East House. There's some trade-offs there that we were able to make based on our eye and observations that we were making on the recovery of our grasses. Then we move from June 19th to July 28th. We said, boy, 20, uh, 21st of June, we lucked out here, 21st of June, it quit raining. We had been raining, raining, raining like crazy. And the 21st of June, it dried up. Well, the 19th, we had already established this plan. But we knew that our rains were going to quit sometime. And we knew we needed a longer recovery period. So this time, we put in a 45-day rest period, which gets us to July 28th. Plan to use all the pastures in that rotation and adjust the length of stay based on the observation of the range. We ended up, as you can see, we planned to use 45. We ended up only 39. This right here is when we opened all the gates and said, cows, what are you capable of doing? What is your rotation going to look like chasing this clover? Turned out we only needed a 39-day rotation. They got through all that in 39 days and not 45 days which said we were pretty much on track. Because when we went back and we started to look at the first pasture they were at, even though it was branding time and they were at the corral, could we have gone back to that pasture? Absolutely. 39 days it had recovered. So, with 2019, we also needed a way to intensify the grazing system but we needed insurance. And this is where things got real interesting for us. We only used half the ranch. We said, all right, if it's traditionally a 200 cow outfit on 8,000 acres, we can double the stocking rate. We already know that's sustainable. We've been doubling the stocking rate. So we should be able to take those same 200 pair and run them on half the ranch. Because for three years now, we have shown that we can do something like that. So we had the confidence in then not grazing 4,000 acres of our ranch. It happened 28 roads, split, like I said earlier. East side, didn't graze it. We had nine permanent pastures ranging from 70 to 925 acres in size on the half of the ranch that we were grazing. Nine permanent pastures, that's not enough for the, not enough paddocks, right? But remember, they are instinctive migratory grazing. So now my 925 acre pasture has multiple pastures within it. When you start calculating up how many pastures are in that 3,700 acres that I was grazing, there's quite a bit of paddocks in there. The cows are finding them themselves. They know how much time they can spend on the ground. They know that they can't graze this badlands area near as intensely as they can this lush draw bottom. They're moving themselves. Basically, we had equivalent to over 45 <coughs> grazing locations. Pasture moves have varied according to the acreage and the plant regrowth in accordance with the plan. The most frequent moves occurred in June during the calving and rapid growth in rain showers. So if you saw, we were moving baby calf pairs through this rotation. The remaining half of the ranch became our insurance for our winter grass. May 23rd through March 20th, we will have grazed through our largest pastures six different times. Obviously, we're not there yet. We are working on the sixth rotation right now. And we have one more pasture to go into that we haven't been in since October or November. So it's gotten some real slow fall regrowth. And probably not even measurable, but there is. I'm hoping I'll get there this week and see there should be some green undergrowth. In September of last year, we looked at it, we had an overabundance available of winter grass. So on that eastern side, we brought in 350 additional pairs to graze that unused grass until December of 2019, still leaving us enough grass that we thought we could probably, well, in fact, we had kicked our cows, some of them, over to help clear off some of that old grass, knowing that also if, we, if our plan ran short on this west side, we could come back over here to the east side and clean it up for winter grass. 2019 stocking rate on the half of the ranch that we grazed dropped to 10 acres to the cow. Overall, bringing in the other cows and opening up that other 4,000 acres, we're now at 13 acres 
to the cow. That right there is a path to our third ranch. And some of you will probably say, well, 13, you're, you're there. You're 39 acres to the cow to 13 acres to the cow. That's, that's three times. We like to figure maybe we're 35. Let's, let's when we push this, let's know for sure that we are tripling it. So just a quick look at when we graze the abundance of the clover. This uh, first picture right here was July 11th, right before we kicked in on the third graze of this pasture. This is what they left for residual in that pasture after two days of graze. There is still a lot of forage left right there, and that's three grazes in. Some of the plant health stuff that we're looking at, a monoculture of buffalo grass. Same pasture, less than 50 feet apart. That's what we're seeing. This is what's telling us our soil health is improving, our plant health is improving. That's a polyculture of buffalo grass, sweet clover, western wheat, blue grama, black root, and Japanese brome. When you get that kind of diversity growing in there, they help each other. And all of a sudden your plants get, they're not really competing, they're helping each other and they get healthier. This is what we're seeing more and more of. And we're seeing less and less of these monoculture sites. This is what I was telling you about in January. The winter when I stopped to get out, it's kind of hard to see. It's kind of washed out, but where I'm pointing, actually, so right here, there's some green in that area where I pulled back. There's green right here at my fingertips where they pulled back. And there's green in that area. It's washed out on the, on the big screen, but it's there. It's short. It's buffalo grass. It's not going to be real tall.